open your ears, open your heart, and get ready to go. If you're ready to go, say, I'm ready. I'm ready. Psalm 92, 13 uh, through 15. Let me read it for you. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bear fruit in old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing to declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. Today I'd like to talk to you about being planted. Actually, there's four dynamic words that the, the psalmist David used in these verses that I'd like to talk to you about. Let me, let me highlight them for you. In verse 13, he uses the word planted and the word flourish. In verse 14, he talks about bear fruit, and then he talks about being fresh and flourishing. So, so these four words, um, planted, flourishing, fruit bearing, and then fresh. Let's look first of all at the word planted. Uh, those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. The word plants, planted simply means to place a seed, a bulb, or a plant in the ground so that it may grow, place, or fix in a specific position. So those that are fixed in their position in the house of God are in a position to grow and to flourish and to bear fruit. David was a man of God that loved God and loved the house of God. When you go to the city of David, you find out that it is just a short distance from Jerusalem. Undoubtedly, according to archaeological studies and excavations, David could have easily looked out his window to the hill on which the temple dwelt, the house of God. And David was known for traversing in, in group on the Sabbath day to the house of worship. The psalms that you and I read today were songs, actually, that were sung as they would, would parade from David's house to the house of God. Now, in the house of God, there was a courtyard, much like any courtyard we would have, much bigger than a, a home, but nevertheless, a courtyard. And David said that he was like a tree planted in the courtyard. A tree in a courtyard is first of all, chosen and very special. A tree in a courtyard is protected and preserved that is given the proper nutrition and the water that it needs because it's in the courtyard. I'm sure you have a tree maybe in your front yard or backyard or on your back porch, and it's a courtyard plant. And that plant was chosen, and that plant is special, and it gets more care than all the other trees. If that tree were maybe somewhere out in the forest, it'd kind of be on its own and do its best. But because it was in the courtyard, because it's on your back porch or my back porch, it gets a lot more care and, it, and it's chosen and it's special. And David saw himself as being planted, not just anywhere, but in the house of God in God's courtyard. He knew that God loved him, that he was special in God's eyes. He knew that God would care for him and nurture him and watch after him because he was special and he was planted in the house of the Lord, in the court of God. David was talking about the unique and wonderful relationship he had with God. He was talking about his affinity for the house of God and worship of God was very important to David. We read where David was said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Because he loved God and he loved the house of God. He loved the worship of God. David would again say, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than dwell in the lavish tents of the ungodly. I'd rather be a lowly servant in God's house than in the richest neighborhoods in town because God, David loved God and he loved the house of God. He loved the worship of God. David was planted. Today in this new covenant, the local church is the house of God and we're committed to the house of God. Not just there are many houses of God in this community. Thank God for all the wonderful churches 
the different denominations, the different church cultures that dot this community. We wouldn't be what we are as a community if it weren't for all the local churches. And God bless every one of them. I believe all of them are houses of God. Every child of God needs their own place to be planted. You know, if you had a tree, let's say that it was a favorite and beautiful, and you planted it in your front yard, and uh, so that every time you pulled in your driveway, there that beautiful tree would be, and you could say, man, I love that tree. And every time some of your friends and neighbors passed your house, they'd look out there and say, man, I, I love that tree. I like that tree in your front yard, and you'd feel so good about it. But after a while, you'd be drinking your coffee in the morning, looking out your breakfast window at the backyard, and say, you know, I'd really rather have that tree in the backyard so when I drink my coffee in the morning, I could just sort of look at it and admire it. So one day you get up and you dig up that tree, and you haul it to the backyard and dig a hole, and you transplant it in the backyard. And you sit there in the morning, drink your coffee, admiring that lovely tree. But after a while, your neighbor says, you know what? I miss that beautiful tree you had in the front yard. I go by there every day. It gave me such pleasure and joy. And I miss that tree. And so you say, you know, I'm so selfish. I put it in the backyard where no one could see, and I would just sit and drink my coffee. I better dig that thing up and put it in the front yard. So you dig it back up, and you take it to the front yard, and you plant it back in the front yard so all your neighbors could see. Now let me ask you this. How beautiful would that tree be after a couple of trips from the backyard to the front yard? You see, you just can't keep transplanting trees. I mean, you get one or two chances, and that's about it. You better get it figured out because that tree's not going to flourish. It's not going to do well if you keep moving it. And you have to be planted in the house of God. You've got to get steel. You've got to grow some roots, build some relationships, become a part of the culture. Let it become a part of you. You've got to get planted in the house of God. You see, that's in the court of God is where we grow and where we flourish and where we're going to do our best, where God is going to look after us and care for us, and we're going to feel His nearness all around. So I want to encourage you to get planted in the house of God. Decide where God wants you and make up your mind, I'm going to get planted and I'm going to grow in that place. Look at the second great word used in this verse. It's the word flourishing. I don't know about you, but there's something beautiful about the word flourishing because of the picture it creates in our mind. When I think of a plant or a tree, a bush or anything that's flourishing, it's just a beautiful picture because, you know, when something is flourishing, its root system has really taken hold. It's getting plenty of water, plenty of nutrition. It's got new shoots and new bloods, buds, and it's blossoming, and it's just beautiful. I mean, it doesn't have to be your favorite kind of a tree. If it's flourishing, it's beautiful. You just love it. Anything that I plant, anything around me that I see flourishing, I tend to love it. It's just something about it. It makes me feel good to know that that tree is locked down or that plant is locked down and is just doing beautiful and wonderful. Flourishing, a person, an animal, or other living organism grow and develop in a healthy or health growing or and, and developing in a healthy or vigorous way, especially as a result of a particularly favorable environment. And so when you're in a particularly favorable environment, you tend to flourish and grow. When everything comes in line spiritually, you begin to grow in your walk with God, in your faith. Every area of your life begins to be positively influenced when you're planted in the house of God and you begin to flourish. You begin to flourish in your faith. Faith begins to rule your heart and your mind, your thinking, your view of life, and your responses to life. In your walk with God, you just begin to flourish and you feel God's nearness. You feel His approval. You feel His closeness. You feel His love. You feel His strength. You're flourishing. You're flourishing in your spiritual gifts. You're flourishing in your service. Things begin to move and take off. You feel like you're getting somewhere. You're growing. You're moving forward. You also begin to flourish in your relationships. You feel like you have meaningful relationships around you. People that are also growing, people that are on a similar walk that you are on, and people that love you and value you as a person unconditionally. So flourishing is about flourishing in relationships as well. I believe that when I'm planted in the place where God has me and I know this is where I'm supposed to be, I begin to flourish, and every area of my life is blessed. 
Certainly doesn't mean that every area of my life is perfect or without any problems or difficulties. Certainly doesn't mean that I'm perfect. It just means that my life is flourishing. I hope that when somebody walks by my life, they feel like I do when I see a, a, a plant or a bush or a tree that's really doing well. They're just flourishing. I want my whole life to flourish. How many of you want your life to flourish? I believe that you do. Then he talks about bearing fruit, bearing fruit. You know, the subject of a Christian bearing fruit is very important to God. He takes this very seriously. And so today, I want to show you some of the really serious scriptures about God de commanding and demanding fruit in our lives, the fruit of what we call Christianity. John 15, 1 and 2, Jesus said this, I am the vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. So when you're in the vine and you're vitally connected with Jesus Christ in relationship, two things are going to happen. Either you're not going to bear fruit and he's going to take you away, cut you off. Or you're going to bear fruit, and He's going to prune you so you can bear more fruit. Now, having experienced both of those things, neither one is very much fun. But I like pruning a lot better than cutting off, that's for sure. So right when you think you're doing really good and everything's going well and just like it needs to go, then God takes out His little snippers and He starts snipping off things and, and cutting things and trimming things. And you know, right after a tree has been pruned is not its most lovely day. It's not its most lovely time. You know, we have a, about 45 or 50 oak trees on our place. And every year I get out there and I prune, give my heart, give my soul to those beautiful oak trees. And every year without fail, my wife says these words, Oh, my God, you have ruined our trees. That's my reward. You have ruined our trees. But, you know, it's not long after she's since forgotten it. And without any apology or the slightest bit of appreciation, the trees start to grow and they start to blah blossom and they look beautiful. That's why those trees are so pretty because I'm out there every year sawing on them. But after I'm finished, i got to admit, they don't look too good. So, God said, if you're fruit-bearing, if you're doing the right stuff, if you're making progress, if things are going good in your life, I'm going to prune you. Let me tell you something. If, if God prunes you, it's not, it's not always fun. And you're not sure if you're being pruned or cut off. You're not sure if you're being trimmed back or being cut down. Because pruning situations are often painful and shocking and undesirable. But if, if you act right, if you respond right, it's a pruning and not a cutting. I just believe that, I really believe that the way we respond to situations that come up in life and developments that happen in life and business and career and, 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 and all those things, things that come up, if we respond correctly, it turns out to be a pruning so we can bear more fruit. And if we don't respond correctly, then we're taken away. So God demands fruit. The very thing that is meant to destroy you is also an opportunity for God to prune you so as to bear more fruit. And that's our desire. What kind of fruit does God expect? I realize that this is... Um, pictorial language here. This is an analogy. Fruit. But what is fruit? I mean, what are you talking about, Pastor? Fruit. When he talks about bearing fruit, what is fruit? Well, it's, of course, spiritual fruit. It is, of course, the fruit of our lives, the summation, the produce, the product of our lives. So I'm going to take you to the book of Galatians and just show you one passage of Scripture. If I were to take three or four weeks on what the Bible talks about fruit, it would not be enough time for me to talk about it all. So I'm just going to go to one of the big main verses, make some comments on it, and ask you to look at this further as the week comes on. Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 16. Just listen carefully, make a note of where it's at, 
Snap a picture with your phone so you can go back and study it this week a little more carefully. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Paul wrote these words to the church at Galatia. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you are not free to carry out your own good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you're not under the obligation of the law of Moses. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results, everybody say the results, are very clear. So if you just let your flesh, your sinful nature, the desires of the flesh, if you let them dominate and let them rule, this is the result. This is what happens. It describes a character, the nature of a person, and the lifestyle of a person. Listen carefully. It says, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outburst of anger, selfish ambition, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. So that, that describes a whole lifestyle, doesn't it? He goes on to say, let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of a life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now remember, I'm reading from the New Testament, the New Covenant. This is the day of grace. This is the day you and I are living in. This verse applies to every single one of us. And if we yield to the flesh and do the things that we naturally do as human beings, this is what the result is. And he said, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Look at verse 22. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit. So the flesh produces all that other stuff. But the Holy Spirit that lives within us produces this kind of fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's no law against these. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to His cross and crucified them there. Since we're living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. So the fruit of the Spirit is very clear. The fruit means the evidence, the result of. The fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. And so that's not the whole Bible on the fruit that God demands, but it's one of the primary locations that teaches us the difference between uh, the lifestyle, the character of a child of God, and one that is not. And so this is the fruit of the Spirit. Now, you know, what little I understand about heart of culture and those kind of things is that um, the sap within a tree, the vital nutrients within a plant uh, begin to multiply and create a life force that pushes up through the trunk and out through the branches. And this could result in additional branches and leaves, or it could result in fruit, or it could result in flowers. But it's the abundance of that life strength inside the plant that pushes it out and that causes the flower to bloom and the fruit to ripen. It's, it's an abundance of life within that tree that comes from the roots that pushes out, that causes the trees to be flourishing and beautiful. That is the Holy Spirit in my life and yours. The more the Holy Spirit is in my life, the more He controls me, the more He lives in me, the more He is expressed through me, the more of the life of God is pushed out into every branch of my life. The more I bear fruit, the more I exemplify the Christ life. It's the Holy Spirit within us that pushes it out. What are some of the spiritual habits that ensure that I'm going to be a fruit-bearing Christian? Like, okay, how do you do that? I want to, be, I want to bear fruit. I get it. I, I want to bear fruit. How do I do that? Well, spiritual habits is a good place to start. 
The first spiritual habit is daily devotion. That's taking maybe 10, 15, 20 minutes. If you've got more, it's better, but take a few minutes every day, read the Scripture, and pray and seek the Lord in your heart every day. There's wonderful Bible devotions online. Your smartphone will be filled with them. There's all kind of daily devotions. You can buy them at the grocery. You can buy them at Walmart. And every day of the year, there's just a, a short scripture and some words of encouragement. It's a beautiful place to start. You know, um, uh, I read a daily devotion just about every single day. I've got several that I love and cherish, and uh, I value them very highly. And uh, another great way to practice the habit of daily devotion is just read the Bible through in a year. And there's wonderful plans. There's probably one in the front of your paperback Bible. Of course, you can look it up online. If you don't have the Bible app, you're probably not even saved, but you can get so today. Just go to your app store, get the Bible app, and you're already saved. But anyway, it will send you a verse every day. It, it's great Bible study. You can read through the entire Bible in the New Testament. But it's a, it's a spiritual habit that is essential. Secondly, you've got to live the sanctified life, the sanctified life. Now, I've got to start preaching on the sanctified life because we're leaving the Word behind. It's a Bible Word. We're leaving that Word behind. When you leave the Word behind, you leave the concept behind. But the sanctified life is still very relevant in this 21st century. A sanctified life is set aside. Paul would say it like this, Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's a sanctified life. So living life the way everyone else is living it that does not know Christ living your life like it's shown on television and like the stars and the, fam the rich and famous live and, and the people on the street live is not the way to live a sanctified life. Listen, Christianity has always been set apart. It's always been unique. It's always been a, a subculture. And when you're a Christian, you can't hide it. When you're a Christian, you can't do what everybody else does and act like everybody and think like everybody else and respond like everybody else because you're sanctified. You're set aside unto God. Don't be conformed to the world. Live the sanctified life. Weekly worship is extremely important. You know, um, David was a man that worshiped weekly. Jesus worshiped weekly in the synagogue. The Apostle Paul encouraged weekly worship. And so weekly worship goes back to the beginning of the history of God's people where weekly people set time aside to worship. I want to encourage you to be faithful in weekly worship. If you'll do these things, the Holy Spirit will increase in your life and you'll begin to bear fruit. It'll change the way you view life, the way you respond to life. It'll, view the what you, it'll change what you think. It'll change your conversation. It'll change your emotions. But, but when the Holy Spirit is in you, it just begins to push good things out into every area of your life. I'm convinced you'll be a better husband. All the wives say amen. And I know you'll be a better wife. All the husbands say amen. You'll be a better son. You'll be a better daughter. You'll better be a better employer or an employee. You'll be a better neighbor when you're full of the Holy Spirit. It's fruit. Now, the third word I want to go to, um, the fourth word I want to go to is the word fresh. Another beautiful word, fresh, fresh. Fresh as opposed to being withered. Fresh as opposed to being stale or rotten or dead. You see, when a, when, a, when a tree is fresh, it has new growth. It has beautiful leaves and flowers and fruit because it's fresh. It doesn't have dead parts in it. You know, when you have a tree or a plant, if you're growing a garden, any branch that is dead, you snip it off to allow the other part to grow. And so fresh means that you're not withered, you're not stale, you're not rotten, you're not dead, but you are fresh. You know, there's something about life that we tend to accumulate baggage. Um, this week or so ago, Renee had a, a, a bunch of our children, our, our grandkids and uh, friends there, and just a lot of kids playing, just so carefree, just so happy, laughing, and, and just having a, a great time. And it was so, so wonderful to watch those children because it makes us lighter, makes us uh, enjoy our lives. But you know, you watch people grow up in life and gradually we accumulate baggage. 
We go from being a lighthearted, carefree, not worried about tomorrow, anything, not thinking about what they've done in the past or worried what might happen to them in the future. We go from that being a lighthearted, carefree, fun-loving kid to we become very heavy adults because we, we tend to collect baggage along the road of life. Let me tell you something, even living for God and being a child of God and being planted and flourishing and enjoying the blessings of God and all those things, we tend to get baggage. We tend to get in a, a situation where we have problems that never seem to end. We have heavy spots in our lives. We have painful places in our lives. And every day we're kind of carrying that baggage. It's an important thing that we learn how to lay baggage down and we don't just keep collecting baggage. By the time you're 30, you can have a pretty good, pretty good load of baggage. Maybe more baggage you can carry. And at some point, you've got to recycle and let the baggage go. But when you get to 40, you'll have another load of baggage, more than you can probably tote around. And when you get to 50 and, and 60, and if, if you don't start offloading baggage before you get where you want to be, you're going to have so much weight on you, you're not going to be a happy person. And the people around you are not going to be happy people. And you're not going to be looking forward to the future because you've got too much baggage. I believe one of the great life skills is learning how to let baggage in life go and not keep carrying it around. Forgiving people around you, including starting with yourself. Not just keep hanging on to thoughts of unforgiveness, resentment, and bitterness. Forgiving and forgetting and moving on with your life. Old oh, wounds that won't heal. Sometime you wake up and realize, you know what, I, I was wounded in that situation. Maybe I caused it. Maybe somebody else caused it. I don't know. But I'm still wounded. And I still hurt in that place. I don't feel like I've ever really got by it and overcome it and moved on with my life. God is in the business of healing old wounds and allow you to be free for them so you can move on. Listen, when you and I meet Jesus, we're all going to have some scars. It's okay to have some scars. Your life and my life is not any worse because we have some scars, evidence of things we've been through, situations of hurt and pain that happened before, but we want them to be scars and not open wounds. So I pray that if you have a, a wound, that God would heal that wound so you can go on with your life. Let it go. It's always a new day. You know, there's a, a, ch a, a book in the Bible that I haven't read a lot. I've read it throughout my life, but it's not one that I go to often. It's the book of Lamentations. How many ever read the book of Lamentations? There's some great nuggets there. You have to look for them. And here's one that I cherish. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 23. The prophet said, Great is His faithfulness. His mercies began afresh each morning. Just think about that. The sun comes up. It may be a rainy day, a cold day, a hot day, a dry day, a windy day. We don't know, but God's mercy is new and fresh every single morning. God's mercy. It's new and fresh. It's not still hanging. It's not depleted from yesterday or the day before. But it's a new day, a fresh beginning, and God has a fresh new attitude about you. He has fresh mercy. He has fresh grace and fresh goodness for you. We just got to get in agreement with God. Everybody say this with me. His mercy, His mercy. begins afresh. Each and, every morning. Each and every morning. Amen, amen. So today I've talked to you about four words. Planted. Flourishing. Fruit bearing. And fresh. How many of you want to be all those things here today? Amen. Thank the Lord.